Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back. I hope you had a wonderful weekend, a wonderful holiday if you celebrated it. It's very good to see you. Uh, as we get started today, I want to begin with just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, Friday is my 32nd birthday, and I'm going to see family for the first time in two years who are traveling here. And so I'm moving my office hours to today and Wednesday so that I can open up some time later in the week. So today I'm gonna to have hours from 3.30 p.m. to 5 p.m. And then on Wednesday, I'm gonna have hours from 12.30 p.m. to 2 p.m. And this is a reminder um, that I really encourage you to visit me. I love seeing students and we can chat about whatever you want. If you have questions about the class, we can address those. Some students in the past have asked if we can review readings in lecture. Uh, although re lecture is not for reviewing assigned readings, we can discuss the readings during office hours and I can address very specific or general questions that you have, or we can even talk about a strategy that you might use to approach the reading. Uh, these are all things that I've done with students during office hours in the past. And so my attitude is that this is time that I set aside for you and that and it really is, is up for grabs. Most of the time I, I don't have students in. And so that, that is space and that is time that could be occupied if you choose to, to come by. You know, you could also talk to me about your strategy for the paper, the, re, the reflection essay. You could come in and take a look at the key for the midterm exam and see exactly where you missed points. Some students had asked for written notes after the grading of the midterm. Uh, although the teaching assistant did not generate written notes, you're more than welcome to come to my office hours and take a look at the key with me. And you can see in vivid detail uh, where you missed points and where you can improve for the final. And in fact, I encourage you to do that. Since we have limited time in lecture to do these sorts of things in so much time in office hours, I think that there's frankly space for every student to come by and do that at some point. So um, take advantage of it. You know, I, I won't ramble on here, but and you don't have to do things the way that I did it. But you know, when I was in college, I always made a point of visiting the faculty and, and instructors and talking with them and asking questions. You know, these are really smart people who you have access to and who you could learn a great deal from. And to be clear, you know, we can just talk about your dog uh, or your grandma if you want, and that would be just as fun and um, I have in the past. So come by and see me and it would be a lot of fun and very useful for us both potentially depending upon what you need and, and what you want to accomplish. But I'm here for you and uh, I'm here for it. So come on by and uh, that's where I'll, I'll leave it for today. Although um, I'm gonna take a peek at the chat and see, oh, thanks so much everybody for the early birthday wishes. I appreciate it so much. This is actually the first time that I've like had a birthday um, with more than a few family or even one in a long time because I've always lived so far away and have always been like, you know, on like a different continent or something. But it's been a long year or so with the pandemic, especially. And so this one should be especially sweet. My parents are going to come and see us, which we're really excited about. Um, Arlene asks, just to clarify, when is the paper due again? It's due on April 9th, so next Friday, or this, I guess, this coming Friday, technically. I'll put up the link closer to Friday. I want students to take all this, the time available to them to soak up the course content. And um, of course, you can come and see me and we can work on your paper or your approach more generally if you want. Oh yeah, Jacqueline asks, did you get an update on your wife's COVID test? Yeah, she tested negative. And so we're obviously like really relieved. I did too. And I actually got the COVID vaccination, the first half of it yesterday. So I'm 50% inoculated, very excited about that. And I'll get the next one in a few weeks. So good things on that front. Thanks for asking. I really appreciate that. 
Really, uh, really appreciate it. Jacqueline asks, have you had any side effects so far? Yeah, uh, my pain, my arm is really sore. And like, intermit like intermittently, it gets really sore and it feels like it's gonna fall off. So, but then sometimes it's manageable. It hasn't been too bad. Uh, you know, I, I know that some of the vaccines have made people pretty sick, but this has been manageable. Although, yeah, the arm pain is 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 pretty um, significant as far as like a vaccine goes. Yeah, I'll do that. I was taking Advil too, because I guess that is uh, acceptable and it seems to work. Uh, I got the. Um, uh, Hey, did I get the Pfizer or the Moderna? I got the Pfizer. I'm asking Allie because she scheduled it for me. <laughs> and although I, I'm the one who has the card, so I should know. Yeah, right on, Jacqueline got the, the Pfizer too. Yeah, if you can get the vaccine, get it. And I don't know what the rules are in California, but in New York, they just actually uh, opened it up to basically anyone. Um, under 30. Previously, it was if you were a frontline worker, and I'm a teacher, educator, so I qualified. But if you're able to get it, go get it. Uh, Ernie says, too, that's the one I also have. Got my second dose this Thursday. Right on. That's exciting. Then you're, then you're in the clear. Oh, Virginia says, on April 15th, everyone can get it. Good. That's coming soon. Yeah, take advantage. All good things. All good things. Very excited to hear. Listen, everybody, we're um, dealing with non-electoral political behavior. And this is um, you know, interesting because it concerns a lot of the kinds of behaviors that sometimes are the most consequential, revolutions and protests, uprisings, riots, social movements. And really the bulk of political activity is non-electoral. It's not just voting on election day that affects politics. It's also mobilizing in large numbers in opposition to governments or authorities. And one of the forms of political behavior that falls under the non-electoral rubric is a riot. And we're actually gonna devote a full week to discussing this particular form of non-electoral political behavior because interestingly, as you'll see, and as we'll analyze in detail, although non-electoral in character, riots and uprisings can actually be understood as intimately associated or linked to electoral behavior and electoral dynamics and politics. And we'll be discovering this this week by focusing on the case of India. And India, as you know, is, is the world's largest democracy. So it's a massive, massive place. It's also a place with uh, significant ethnic conflict and in particular riots, ethnic and religious riots. So we have an opportunity to learn a great deal from India by studying the politics and the electoral dynamics of riots. and will both define and conceptualize riots and talk about the various actors, as well as assess different theoretical perspectives on conflict, ethnic conflict, riots. And what I want you to think about throughout is how riots are connected to or linked with electoral dynamics and politics. How is it that party competition or electoral competition relates to riots. How is it that India, being a democracy, can be understood as a place that, while democratic, is also subject to riots for many of the same reasons, because of democratic politics and, and conflict? Give me just a moment. One of my cats is making a ruckus. Need to try. COVID times. Oh, thanks, Virginia. I appreciate that. I really appreciate the early birthday wishes, everybody. So 
the definition that we're going to use is a riot is a form of civil disorder in which a group lashes out in a violent public disturbance against authority, property, or people. And this is a simple definition, but it actually involves a number of different components that we need to think about piece by piece. Any riot involves on the one hand, some group in the cases that we'll look at, we're talking about a religious group in particular, but it also involves civil and public authorities, you know, the government, the state, right? The, the security forces or the police, but the central authority that is the, the subject or the target or a, an arbitrator in this, this conflict or this riot. And in this regard, this non-electoral behavior involves different players and we can understand it as a kind of interaction between political actors. You have the people or the group on the one hand and then the state, the security forces on the other. And so what this means then is that the state as well as society are involved in the interplay, the dialogue, the, the conflict. And that means then that there are not just individuals and groups in society who constitute a moving part, but also the state itself. And the state can choose to enforce and secure an area and prevent uprisings and police an area so as to prevent uprisings or riots, or they can choose not to. And in this way, the use of the capacity or the power of the state to prevail and secure the state from violence or riot or uprising becomes an important part of, of political behavior and the consequences of potential riots. And you'll see what I mean as we go along. We'll see that in India, there's an important role for the state or the security forces really the government more generally in making a decision about how to respond to or not respond to potential violence or potential uprisings or riots in the ways that electoral competition uh, relate to these choices on the part of the security forces in the state and the, and the government more generally. So we're gonna be examining the case of India and we're gonna be using the case of India and more recent events in 2019 and 2020 to illustrate some of these riots that we talk about. And then ultimately, we'll begin to step back and consider some different perspectives before we, we, we dive more deeply into this discussion about electoral dynamics and political and party fragmentation and state responses and government responses to, to potential uprisings and specifically in the case of India. So there's a lot here and we'll do this piece by piece. What I hope to eventually do on Friday is uh, present you with some scenarios, some hypothetical scenarios that will let us think through some of the alternatives or the choices or the conditions that governments and central authorities respond to when they decide how to to interact with, with groups who may or may not pose the, the, the potential to, to riot. Hope, did you have a question? I just had a quick question for um, clarification. Is there like a certain characteristic that um, like res uh, separates a riot from like something bigger? Like does the population of the civil disorder matter? Like um, what's necessary? really separate something like a civil war or something like that against a riot? Well, a civil war usually has a specific definition. It's a conflict that lasts more than one year. It usually involves more than 1,000 deaths. This target or one of the actors is the state, and there's a violent insurgency by a non-state actor that seeks to replace or dissolve the state. So we do have a specific definition for a a civil war. The, this is the definition that we have for a riot. I don't know if there's like a volume or a scale that becomes a factor in distinguishing between a riot 
and um, say something else. But I think that the riot, the definition of a riot is encompassing of, of a variety of different scopes or scales of, of conflict or violence. You'll see that in the examples in India, the riots themselves can involve literally hundreds of thousands of people. But more generally, usually what happens is there are waves of riots or uprisings. And a, a single riot might mean individual uprisings or revolts or uh, conflicts in various places throughout the country, right? That all seem to uh, have been triggered by, by the same common cause. So I think for our purposes, it's just most useful to think about, well, a riot is one form of collective non-electoral political behavior that is really mainly about violent opposition through public disturbance. The opposition targeted at authorities uh, or the property or the people associated with the authorities, or in the cases in India, as you'll see, specific groups who uh, are the, the victims of, of the violence perpetrated by, by other groups. And so riot is then an example of a non-electoral political behavior and a collective behavior. And it does constitute something that's distinct from say a civil war uh, or something else. And uh, for our purposes, let's think about what a riot would mean in terms of, of non-electoral political behavior by a collective group of people using violence in, in, in violent opposition to, to authority. The example of India is a really good place for us to look because there actually may be no um, country more synonymous with, with ethnic and religious riots than India. In fact, since independence, there've been, in, actually since before independence even, there've been approximately 100 uh, religious riots by my count. I counted the riots on uh, the Wikipedia page, the encyclopedia page for, for religious riots and the, the references cited were, were um, upstanding. So I, I have no reason to believe that the information is incorrect, but I counted at least a hundred of them. And that's, that's only those that were reported or that are reported in that list. So the point is that in the space of, of less than a hundred years, there've been at least 100 significant large scale events involving uh, the use of violence carried out by, by members of, a, of an ethnic group often in opposition or in, 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 in violent opposition to another group. And in the case of India, what that usually has meant is, is Hindus attacking Muslims. And in India, Hindus are, are the majority and, and Muslims are the minority. And this ethnic and religious violence has often been associated with ethno-nationalism or ideologies that, that promote the kind of self-determination of, of Hindus and the formation of a sort of Hindu state in, in, in India. And this violence and this conflict between groups has really been the, the main characteristic of the violence in the rioting in India. And so for our purposes, you'll notice that that's the, the main nature of the, of the rioting and in, in the uprisings and in the conflict in India. Now, as we proceed and before we eventually begin to consider what some of the links between votes and violence might be, it's notable for, that we point out the following. We know that there are fewer riots when Congress is in session and generally speaking, after ethnic and religious riots, the BJP, which is a conservative uh, right-wing, predominantly Hindu sort of nationalist leaning party in India tends to gain approval. And this is perhaps not unexpected because in India, as I already established, Hindus constitute the, the majority and when uh, violence or disorder seems to break out, it may be that that majority uh, responds by digging in its, its heels or deepening its, its commitment to those power structures that seem to support and promote a kind of Hindu nationalist uh, vision of, of Indian sovereignty. 
So look, let's not beat around the bush. There are some very delicate issues at hand. And the fact that India is the single largest democracy in the world um, presents us with a, a very complicated situation because as you already know, promoting democracy means promoting solidarity and, and toleration and equality and equity and in this sort of um, sense of collective mutual shared fate that transcends these, these often more parochial differences, democracy relies on promoting that solidarity. And if you can't promote and create that, democracy may not survive or take root in the first place. And so in India, the challenge has much to do with, with overcoming uh, the, the scourge of, of nationalism and in this this sort of ethnic intolerance and so so we can be honest and straightforward about that while we simultaneously try to look at the situation in, in a sterile and objective way for the purposes of, of analyzing uh votes and violence and riots and in, in as a form of non-electoral political behavior so as we embark i want to first draw your attention to the significant variation from from state to state India is a federal state, so that means that there is a distribution of power between the central government and the state governments, and then, of course, local governments, and then, then even lower levels of, of, of governments. That di division of power often can itself correspond to significant differences in, in violence and, and in riots. So consider the distribution of riots just in the year 2012. You'll notice that some states had uh, significantly higher rates of rioting uh, than others. Some were relatively free from riots, and others had many, many riots, numerous, more than a dozen. And just in that year alone, there were 93 fatalities from riots, and there were 640 riots that were actually recorded. That's just one year, 2012. And you consider then that every year would probably present a, a considerable, an enormous and extraordinary number of, of these events. And, and therefore the problem is quite, quite significant and quite real. So this is the situation on the ground. We'll be examining the case of India and we'll be examining riots and we'll be trying to think about the links between electoral systems and, and electoral dynamics and political considerations and, and ethnic violence as expressed through riots. So the way we'll do this is by first watching some video footage that illustrate the events in recent years, in 2019, in 2020, late 2019, there were riots in Delhi in response and around these bills promoted by the government um, related to citizenship and in certain limits that would be placed on, on citizenship. It's a very, very complex situation. And so what we'll do is watch these videos that put this in a great amount of detail and describe it much more elegantly and gracefully than I could. So we'll watch the, vid the video footage and then return and we'll begin to uh, have a discussion that's more substantive and theoretical in that will involve some discussion and some uh, some brainstorming. There is an uneasy calm in Delhi, kept by hundreds of police and paramilitary. It has come late. At least 35 people have died and over 200 injured in the worst communal riots in decades. <laughs> Trouble began between the Hindu majority and Muslim minority over the controversial citizens' law brought in by the nationalist government under Prime Minister Modi. This is what's left of the family business of Mohammad Azad and his brother. The shops vandalized and set alight. Everything is destroyed. The families lived above the shop and had to flee when the fire began spreading. It's a tear gas. This is a tear gas fired on us, he tells me. I've been hit too. His home now in cinders, there is nothing to salvage. 
As he shows me around, he says my lifetime earnings are all but in ashes. I am totally destroyed. My home is unsafe. Where am I to go? Policing of the cities under the federal government. The force has come under severe criticism of being ineffective in providing security in Muslim areas. This is one of the most sensitive areas of, uh, of Northeast Delhi where there's been uh, communal clashes and now we're seeing regular flag marches by the police out here to maintain peace. With more paramilitary and police deployed, the trouble has been put under control for now. They have been to very narrow streets and everywhere everything is peaceful, absolutely. In a few weeks, a wedding was to take place in Razia's home. Two days ago, it was set alight. Everything in ruin now. They frightened us so much, we can't live. The peace between the communities has been ripped. The minorities here live in fear, and with a right-wing nationalist government, this concern grows. Never Lazarus, Sky News, Delhi. So this is footage from 2019. And the context has a, a lot to do with a bill advanced by the nationalist government. And let's watch a video that puts that in detail so that we can better understand the situation. U.S. President has arrived in India. A lavish spectacle. The whole world watching the U.S. President's visit to India. A lot of the news coming out of India has revolved around Trump's visit, but I know that there's a lot more going on in India at the moment. Can you tell us what's happening in Delhi? Right now, Delhi is in a state, I would say, of uneasy tension. We saw a really gruesome 72-hour period of violence that broke out between Hindus and Muslims in the northeastern part of Delhi. Cars burning, mosques being torn down, people being killed and beaten, uh, pelted with stones and so on. Around 40 people were killed in Delhi and hundreds were injured. It is true that there was Muslim-led violence, but when you step back and look at who bore the brunt, it was uh, the Muslim community. Why is this happening? What's What sparked the situation? Since the Modi government came back to power in May of 2019, it has moved with a real sense of urgency and a kind of clarity of purpose towards enacting a kind of pro-Hindu agenda. The most recent thing it's done is enacted this citizenship amendment bill. So what the bill does is it provides expedited citizenship to illegal migrants who land up in India from one of three neighboring countries, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, and Pakistan, if those people belong to essentially any religious community other than Islam. Immediately, we saw protests in the streets, primarily for Muslims. So why is this bill so controversial? This was seen as actually a prelude to an even larger initiative to create a national register of Indian citizens. Many Indian citizens whose families have lived there for generations, they don't actually have the documents to help them prove their citizenship. So you can imagine a scenario where both Hindus and Muslims cannot prove their citizenship, but Hindus will be given a kind of lifeline through the Citizenship Amendment Act because they can be given amnesty, essentially, where Muslims, because they're specifically denied expedited citizenship under the law, uh, would have no other recourse. And this raises a question, if there is a process to figure out who's a legitimate resident and who's not, what do you do with the people who are not? What do you do with the people who are deemed illegal? Tens of thousands queued up across the Sam to check if they are Indians or not. Detention centers for illegal citizens. India's first detention center in Assam, many more are planned. There have been detention camps built in Assam. It is a pilot project in a sense. The protests began first at primarily Muslim colleges and universities in and around Delhi, but then they quickly spread all around the country. 
where you saw in some cases hundreds of thousands of people saying this new law is antithetical to the liberal, secular, democratic spirit of the Constitution. And some of the Hindu majority sections in Delhi were growing increasingly outraged with the severity of the protests. They really used the fact of these protests to uh, fuel counter protests. You have legislators who are sort of using their bully pulpit uh, to kind of fan these flames. The riots that we've seen in recent days have been restricted to Delhi. The real worry is that what we saw in Delhi is potentially the harbinger of what could happen on a larger scale in other parts of the country. Once the, the violence broke out in Delhi, um, how was it addressed? It took about 72 hours for the police to essentially flood the streets with enough uh, manpower to restore order. And the lingering question is why it took so long. If this was such a brazen display of violence, why didn't the police do anything about it? Uh, and in fact, there's video and photographic evidence to suggest that in many cases, the police either looked the other way or aided and abetted uh, the mobs. Prime Minister Modi was very slow in issuing a statement about the violence. This was during the tail end of U.S. President Donald Trump's visit to India, a state visit. You would see the president meeting Prime Minister Modi, and you would see parts of Delhi going up in flames. He could have spoken sooner to try to um, cool the tension. People that are out in the streets protesting, what is it that they want to achieve with these protests? They want to see, essentially, the government repudiate or repeal this new bill or amend it so that it does not, by omission, single out Muslims. That's number one. I think number two is they want some kind of credible commitment that this is not a prelude to a All India Citizens Registry. What has created so much uncertainty and so much angst is that no one knows what the end game actually is if they actually go through this process and they find people who are illegal. That question mark is why you see so much anxiety right now in India. All right, <clears throat> so this situation is complicated. There are riots where Hindus attack Muslims, but there are also large protests where both Muslims and Hindus oppose the citizenship bill passed by the government. And that second part, those protests, you can really think of that as having a lot to do with those social movements that we talked about where they have a specific cause or demand this week, what we're discussing is that first half, the riots, the, the violent part. And those riots and uprisings need to be understood in terms of the relationships between ethnic or religious groups, and especially between majorities and minorities. And in the case of India, that majority is a Hindu majority, and the minority is, is, a, is a Muslim minority. And the, the rioting and the, the violent uprisings have targeted primarily that, that Muslim minority. And so we want to understand this ethnic violence and these uprisings and these riots in a systematic way. You are and in particular, what we're going to be doing this week is trying to think about the electoral dynamics and the political factors that shape riots and, and violence of this kind. But before we get there, let me discuss with you the conventional or existing approaches, explanations of ethnic conflict and uprisings and riots. And I wanna discuss three of these with you. These explanations come from uh, political science, of course, uh, but they also have an important role in, in international relations and, and in a variety of areas of political science where we study political violence and, and political violence in terms of the behavior of those perpetrating violence, but, but also perhaps the behavior of, of the state 
or the government uh, in response to or in relation to violence. So the first approach or the first theory is what's called the ancient hatreds perspective. And this is a theory or a, a perspective that says that ethnic groups are inherently prone to conflict and these conflicts or these riots or these tensions are bound to break out um, really whenever they're triggered by some underlying uh, tension or event. In this case, you might say that the um, antagonisms around the citizenship law and, and the clear effort on the part of the nationalist government might have instigated or, or, or sort of stimulated some of that inherent uh, tendency towards conflict and in particular uh, drove the, uh, the, the Hindu majority to, uh, to attack the, the uh, Muslim minority. That's the ancient hatreds approach. The second uh, theory or perspective is, is what's called instrumentalism. And this is the idea that politicians and parties, governments, like for example, President Modi, use ethnicity or conflict or tensions to mobilize political support and to build or, uh, or, or kind of harness that, that political support for their own cause, to reinsure their political survival, to uh, prolong their hold on power, to, to benefit them, themselves and to entrench their power. This is very much uh, about the, the political interests of those elites and the way that they can benefit from, from riots caused by ethnic tensions between a, a majority and a minority group. Then there's a third approach which falls under constructivism. And this is the idea that ethnic conflict and riots really result from narratives of, of master cleavages that themselves are constructed by colonizers and authorities or outsiders who have who have influenced or constructed a narrative in such a way as to create a dominant group and a, a submissive or a, or an inferior group. And a good example is 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 like Rwanda, um, where the Hutu and the Tutsi were sort of constructed as 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 groups of of differing strength or or importance. This master cleavage narrative constructed by the Belgians in Rwanda can be used to explain uh, genocide and ethnic conflict in Rwanda. But for our purposes, none of these approaches are really that satisfying because remember that we're thinking about ethnic conflict and violence and riots in particular in the context of non-electoral political behavior. And we wanna think about you know, politics and political considerations or those reasons that people choose a certain course of action uh, in pursuit of a, a, a certain objective. And so what I want to begin to do with you is address and think about a series of questions that, that help us to start to understand or consider the links between votes and violence and the, really the electoral dimensions of ethnic violence. And these questions are first, what are the links between votes and violence? What is the electoral dimension of ethnic violence? And, and maybe what electoral or political factors shape government responses to, to riots? It, it, so in other words, you know, what do elections and what do democratic politics have to do with ethnic violence and with riots? Uh, why are we even considering or talking about these things in conjunction with one another at all? Uh, do votes in elections at all relate to riots or uprisings in a way that is systematic or in a way that, that makes these things useful to study? These are the kinds of questions that I want us to address first through an exercise where we brainstorm together as we often do before we begin to uh, analyze these things and these questions on Wednesday and then eventually on, on Friday. So I'm gonna bring up a, a Word document and we're going to do this together. And give me a moment here.
Hope, do you have a question or is that from earlier? Oh, it could apply to this brainstorming as well. I just forgot to put my hand down. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, well, do you wanna um, get us started? Uh, where mine, where my, my mind is going with these questions is that like, I think that votes don't exist in a vacuum. And a lot of the times in democratic governments, the, um, the parties will push narratives to get people to vote. So I'm thinking that maybe um, ethnic violence and riots and things like that would be related to voting due to um, propaganda or things like that. And that would probably, that's what I'm thinking is like related to how votes influence violence. So like in the video where we saw that politician, you know, saying like mother India and kind of appealing to the idea that um, that India is 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 something for for Hindus and and that there's a a certain kind of India for them to construct and that it may not include Muslims and that's an example I think of what you're talking about right like politicians using these ideas and and perhaps trying to spur violence for for instrumental reasons. Uh, okay, certainly. So we can think about how there may be a political role or a role for that kind of, of, of behavior by politicians. Good. What else can we say to this or where should we go with it next? Coalition governments are one way to protect the minorities against violence because they might have different constituencies than just one party. Like the BJP has a large anti-minority constituency. This is very important to keep in mind. Coalitions become especially important in these environments because by definition, coalitions are combinations of multiple actors. And so often what this can mean in practice is that you incorporate minorities. And one concept that captures this is what's called the grand coalition government, where there are essentially seats or places created at the table for a variety of different groups. And in this way, the inclusion of minorities gives all of the individual players uh, an incentive to protect them and to, um, to govern in a way or to, to conduct politics in a way that, that would perhaps prevent this kind of violence or this, this, sort, this sort of uh, uprising or, or, or tension. And so that's certainly a, a consideration. And Ishan makes this point about these, these grand coalitions. This is especially important under what we, we refer to as, as uh, consensual democracy. Consensual democracy is a system that's characterized by institutions that create formal roles for minority groups so as to help to prevent this sort of this sort of conflict. Okay, good. What else? Where should we go from here? Would you mind explaining the third question a little bit more? Yeah, no, good. I'm, I'm glad you asked. So far, we've talked mainly about um, parties and, and, and politicians. And we've talked a little bit about grand coalitions. The third question is asking about the government's calculus and its vantage point. When there's a uprising or a riot in a government faces a set of potential responses we can repress we can um, secure the area <clears throat> or we can ignore the situation and let it fester for example I guess the question I'm asking is can you think of any factors that might cause governments to choose one response over the other can you think of any reasons that governments might for example make it a priority to stamp out riots or not make it a priority? Can you think of any reasons that might lead them down one path or the other? Okay. 
Chandon says, I believe that these riots show the lack of control from the governments. But at the end of the day, people know that all parties are corrupt and it just comes down to which corruption to vote for, which is the least threat to the people. So Chandon suggests that this shows the, the weakness of the authorities, right? The government. But what I would wonder and ask is, is that by design or is that despite the government's best efforts? You know what I'm saying? Are they choosing, for example, to ignore the riots in some places or are they simply unable and incapable of securing the area, so to speak? And I wanna bring your attention to that comment in the video that said, there are widespread reports of insufficient or totally absent policing in predominantly Muslim areas. And in fact, there is considerable variation even within some Muslim areas in the effectiveness of policing or the presence of the state in the state's response to the rioting. That seems like a really, really, really important factor or set of patterns, right? Because it suggests that, well, there may be a question about whether we're talking about the weakness of the state despite its best efforts or the weakness of the state as a deliberate policy choice. And this is what I mean when I'm wondering, are there certain factors that would shape the government's choice to or to not respond effectively to riots? Can you think of political considerations or electoral considerations that might motivate them to respond effectively or to ignore these riots? And I'm beginning to suggest perhaps uh, that we consider Wilkinson in his argument. And what we'll do this week is we'll walk step by step through some of the logic of those kinds of arguments. And we'll think about the politics in the electoral dynamics of, of riots in, in particular uh, multi-ethnic emerging democracies. And I think that as some students have already noted, what's so useful and interesting about this reading and about the case of India is that we see the interaction and the sort of relationship and the links between ethnic and communal violence and, and democratic and electoral politics and where they intersect and under what conditions uh, riots do and, and do not get, get stamped out effectively by, by police and security forces representing uh, elected governments. Thanks so much for being here, everybody. Uh, I wasn't able to get to all of the, um, the contributions and I'm, I'm so sorry about that. Uh, but what I'm gonna do as I did before is I'm going to um, try to input the contributions of individual students on this document and then I'll share and save and share the documents, our notes from class on CAC courses. Okay, and you can find that under, under the, uh, the files as usual. So good to see you. Welcome back. Have a wonderful rest of your day and uh, I'll see you on Wednesday or during office hours if you choose to join me. Yes, yeah, stay safe. Thanks so much for that, Chandon. Good to see everybody. Have a great day.